Commerce Secretary, great to have you with us. I'd like to start by talking on, about the tariffs and the 15-day negotiating period that's been described. Do you have countries that are already ready, prepared to negotiate exclusions to the tariffs in that short period? Uh, I believe we do. And uh, the periods conceivably could take a little longer than that. But we believe there are several who are ready. Uh, remember, we had lots of testimony prior to concluding the report. So we have a pretty good idea as to where people stand. What happens if the negotiations take longer than the 15 days, Commerce Secretary? Will you automatically apply the tariffs or will you give them a bit more time? Well, that's the point I was trying to make. You notice that the president said in the case of Canada and Mexico, he would suspend the tariffs pending negotiations being successful. But while the negotiations were underway, he would suspend them. What about other countries, though, like the European Union, like South Korea, like Russia? Well, those are certainly countries that are potentially affected, and uh, we'll just have to see what comes of them. The EU Trade Commissioner said today that they certainly are not a threat to U.S. security, and they expect to be excluded from the tariffs. Are they a threat, or, or will they be excluded? Well, the way he's phrased the question doesn't really fit. It, it isn't a question of them being as such a security threat. The major question is the imports overall constituting a security threat. That's the difference between the two. It isn't that we think the EU is necessarily going to use steel against us. It's a, it's a different kind of a question because Section 232 of the 1962 Act, which is the legal basis for what we're doing, defines national security as much broader than just military security. It talks about the effect on the economy, talks about the effect on individual industries, employment. It talks about supplying material to critical infrastructure industries. It goes on and on and on. So it isn't that we're saying that the EU is a direct military threat to the United States. So does it cover unfair trade practices too? Because the, the president has made this a great deal about unfair, tra unfair trade practices. And there are those that believe you've kind of undermined your own argument on the national security front. But are you saying that unfair trade practices are covered under this section? No, part of the problem in both steel and aluminum and part of the reason why it can't be a very pinpointed a uh, set of remedies is uh, the violating countries do transshipment. So if we put a regular tariff under w normal WTO procedures, it has to be very precise as to the product and very precise as to the country. So what happens in the real world is that country then transships it through another country against which we don't have a trade action. And they may transship it with some further processing or transship it without further processing. So that's where the unfair trade practices play in. The other fundamental problem is that people keep building capacity even though there's grotesque amount of oversupply globally. And that is not technically an unfair trade practice, but it is what has contributed mightily to the problems we're facing right now. There's clearly been outcry, though, in the United States. Are you expecting some form of litigation from, from trade bodies, from companies within the United States that, that think this will negatively impact them, that ultimately delays these tariffs in the interim? Well, first of all, the impact on the U.S. economy, even if there were no exceptions ever granted to anyone, would be pretty trivial. 
It's a tiny fraction, much less than a half a penny a can on soup, much less than half a penny a can on tuna fish, much less than a half a penny a can on beer, soft drinks, things of that sort. So it's very, very small in terms of its direct impact. Even cars, it's only a fraction of 1%. So you're not expecting so litigation? It, well, I don't know. In America, it's easy for people to litigate. So I certainly wouldn't want to say I don't think it's possible that anyone will. But we do have, in addition to the potential for country exclusions, we also have individual product exemptions available. And that's a process that commerce will manage. The country exclusions uh, are at the discretion of the president. I mean, if I take Europe as an example again, one of the companies that they've targeted or will target as a result is Harley-Davidson. What's your message to workers at Harley-Davidson that believe that you've prioritized the jobs of steel workers over theirs? Well, it's not that we prioritize the steel workers over them. What happens if these tariffs, counter, the, the retaliatory things come into effect is they were picked out by the EU not by us. Further, there's a whole process that the EU or anybody else wanting to take retaliation needs to go through under the World Trade Organization rules. So unless the EU were to violate the WTO, this isn't going to be an instantaneous thing. Commerce Secretary, I want to uh, move on and talk to you about China. Can you confirm that the Chinese have been asked to come up with a plan to reduce their deficit on an annual basis by around $100 billion a year? Well, I think it's clear that that was a report that came from Washington. I was not directly involved in any such call, so I only know from the sources that you have. But the sources that you, that you have say the same, Commerce Secretary. I'm sorry? But, but your sources tell you the same, that it is $100 billion that they're working on. Well, I know that a request was made. I don't have myself confirmation that it was the 100, but it wouldn't surprise me if that were the number. Is that credible? And do you think the Chinese would be on board with that, at least looking? Do the Chinese recognize at this stage that something has to change and that there's an asymmetry here that needs to be addressed? Oh, I think they're well aware that there's an asymmetry. What the probabilities are that they will come with any specific number, we'll have to see. That'll be a result of negotiation. Just for our uh, radio listeners here, we are talking to the U.S. Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross. Commerce Secretary, what is that probability that they're willing and able to come up with something to the tune of even $10 billion, $50 billion versus $100 billion? Well, uh, when we were over there a few months ago, they did make commitments between investment and various trade deals such as LPG, LNG, sorry, such as LNG, they made uh, uh, lots of commitments. So there is a clear understanding that something has to be changed in the trade relationship between the United States and China. I want to bring it back to the White House now, uh, Sarah, and ask you whether or not you would back Peter Navarro as a replacement here for, for Gary Cohn. No, I'm not here to discuss personnel changes. Uh, I'm here to try to help people understand the details of the president's trade plan. I understand that, Commerce Secretary, but do you, who do you think would then be best placed? Because there is a fear from investors here that, for whatever reason, that those voices around the president are in danger of creating some kind of broader trade tensions, a trade war as it's being termed. Are those investors overreacting, being alarmist? Well, a lot of these same people were very frightened that the president was 
not going to be able to get a tax bill through. And in fact, he got through this enormously favorable tax bill, cuts in rates, and reforms in process. So I think you ought to, they ought to judge the president on his actual results, not on some theory as to what might happen. And, and finally, Commerce Secretary, I know you want to talk about trade, but I do feel while I have you here, I should ask about the rumors circulating that the Goldman Sachs CEO, Lloyd Blankfein, might indeed be stepping down from leadership at Goldman Sachs. I know you know him very well. I just wanted to get a quick comment from you if indeed that story is ultimately true. Well, I, I am not here to comment on personnel matters, especially those of unrelated companies. I do have a very close relationship with Lloyd Blankfein. I've done a lot of business with him over the years, and I have the greatest of respect for him. But as to whether he will step down, I have no idea and no ability to comment. We will all continue to speculate. U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Rosser, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to all our listeners on Bloomberg Radio 2.